Hello, my name's Dick Sands. I work for Stamcor. I've worked for Stamcor for more than half of my career. I started my career in September 1977, so I'm now into my 45th year in the steel industry. So I've seen and learned a lot. And the views that I'm about to express are my own views are not necessarily the views of STEM core. I'd like to make that very clear. Um, my views have been right often enough so that I'm still employed, but they've been wrong often enough so that I still need to be employed. STEM core is a global com company, a steel trading company, the largest global independent steel trading company, by which I mean independent from a steel producer. We have a global footprint which allows us to offer global marketing services to our suppliers and global sourcing services to our customers. On to the next slide. Here you'll see four characters, three of whom you probably recognize very well. And the two on the left um, from right-wing parties, Donald Trump from the Republicans and Boris Johnson from the Conservative Party. Right-wing, you'd normally associate with free trade, but these two characters um, didn't support free trade very much with their intervention in steel trade. Top right is Jean-Claude Juncker, former president of the European Union. He oversaw the introduction of safeguard measures by the European Union, pursuant to Donald Trump's Section 232 measures in the United States. And then Bojo, or Boris Johnson, in the bottom left-hand corner, when he succeeded in executing Brexit and taking the UK out of the European Union, very sadly, I might add, he introduced safeguard measures in the UK. And government intervention is a big part of the steel trade, the steel industry today. It's not the first time it's happened. The gentleman in the bottom right-hand corner, Count Etienne d'Avignon, uh, in the beginning of 1978, just after I started in the steel industry, announced the manifest crisis in the European coal and steel community, in the steel industry, and introduced minimum import prices, the first major government intervention in steel trade. Didn't work particularly well, but um, it shows that these things have been around for a long time. On to the next slide. Next slide's all about China. The world of steel today revolves around China. When I started in the steel industry, China was about 10% of steel production and consumption. Today, it's closer to 60%. It's absolutely massive. The chart on the left, left shows the average monthly production in each of the years from 2010 through to this year. And as you can see, it's grown from something like 52 million tonnes a month in 2010 up to 89 million tonnes a month year to date 2021. The central chart is the monthly production last year, pretty consistent, a bit of a dip early on in the year, but steady and high. And then the chart on the right shows the monthly production in 2021. As you can see, um, quite strong through to May, a little dip in February. It's a short month, February, 28 days, which probably explains that. But monthly production rising up to a peak in May, um, close to 100 million tonnes in one month. And since then, significant reduction month by month. Steel production has actually dropped 30% from its peak in China, which is a staggering statistic. If you then look at what's happened to exports from China, exports have, have, have reduced for sure, but not by as much as one might have expected. Still four and a half million tons in October, which is the most recent figures we have. So that does beg the question, what's happened to steel consumption, to steel demand in China? If production has reduced so much, um, exports um, haven't reduced very much, and steel stocks don't seem to have driven up very much, that suggests that steel demand in China has reduced significantly this year. A really big number, difficult to gauge what. What are the possible reasons for that? Um, well, coal for sure, there's a shortage of coal, shortage of thermal coal, shortage of metallurgical coal. Um, so the, the thermal coal has created energy problems. China wants to keep its homes warm, its houses warm, its crucial industries going. Other industries had less power, so industrial production has reduced and thus steel consumption has reduced. 
Also, China has a stranglehold on COVID. It's been a very good and effective and strong stranglehold. A little bit weaker more recently as the contagious variants are spreading. Uh, and possibly in trying to manage that, that's reducing steel consumption as well. But big question marks over steel consumption in China. On to the next slide. The other big factor in the steel industry today is the demand and need, the pressure for green steel, the issues of carbon allowances, carbon credits, and carbon border taxes going forward. The first thing I'd like to say is the time scale for the movement towards green steel is on a very long basis. This isn't going to happen overnight. Um, there is new technology, SSAB, green steel in Sweden. Um, there are announcements by ArcelorMittal and others of the moves towards carbon-free by furnace steel, but uh, that's going to take a long, long time to come. Uh, there is scrap, of course, steel scrap, electric art furnace, where the carbon emissions are much lower than blast furnace, but there isn't more scrap. The scrap that we're collecting today comes from the steel that we produced 20, 30, 40 years ago. And we can't change history, those numbers are fixed. And new scrap availability is only going to grow slowly. So we need to move to other versions of green steel. Then there's coal. Uh, coal is in very short supply. Coal is an unattractive business to many people, to many sectors. The uh, banking industry don't like lending money to, to coal miners. The investment community doesn't like investing in coal production and governments don't like granting licenses for coal production. But we're creating a rod for our own, our own back because we're reducing coal or constraining coal, avail coal availability faster than we're creating green alternatives. And that's resulted in the exorbitant prices and shortages of thermal and metallurgical coal today. Classic example is West Cumbrian mining in the northwest of England, a metallurgical coal resource that still hasn't been granted a license to open. Instead of producing our own uh, metallurgical coal in the UK, for the UK and Europe, we'd rather pay the carbon um, emissions of transporting grossly expensive Australian coal to the UK and Europe. Madness that we're not doing it. We're going to need coking coal until the green steel replaces it, and we have to be giving some support to the coal industry. Then there's the green steel consuming industry. If you look at the automotive industry, the construction industry, the yellow goods industry, and others, they've all got their own plans to reduce their carbon footprint. And that means uh, low carbon steel purchasing and they're all very keen on doing that going forward it's a big thing for the automotive industry we see it in the construction companies like kingspan that make sandwich panels all those um amazon warehouses are made out of these sandwich panels and these companies want and need green steel going forward they're going to have to pay a premium for that green steel and um uh, I can see that supporting the prices of green steel going forward, which is a good thing. And then finally, there is the low hanging fruit for steel consumers of scrap based electric art furnace steel rather than blast furnace steel. That reduces the carbon footprint from something like half a ton of carbon per ton of steel and with electric art furnace down from two tons per, of carbon per ton of steel for blast furnaces. So I think that's going to increase the demand for scrap and keep scrap prices high. They're going to be well supported by this movement. On to my final screen, and this shows the history of global hot roll coil pricing in the three major markets around the world, the US, the EU, and China. And you'd imagine that the great Western free market economies of the US and the EU would be the... the the real free markets and um, China government controlled uh, would be the less free market. But in fact, you can see that prices have moved pretty much in tandem across these. But um, what's made prices diverge has been government intervention. And that government intervention from those supposedly free markets, the US and the EU. Firstly, you can see Section 232 coming in June 2018, safeguard measures in the European Union following that. The next significant point is the onset of COVID, and then you can see how prices rocketed after that. Prices 
doubled as the COVID recovery took hold, prices doubled in China, trebled in Europe and quadrupled in the United States. And that trebling and quadrupling in those respective markets reflected the government intervention. That may be not a bad thing. What I call the protectionist premium that those markets have will give more money to the steel producers, perhaps allowing them to invest in green steel. Also carbon border taxes and um, carbon taxes for steel producers going forward will also create funds for green steel. But all of these things will also support the, the price of steel. And finally, as I said earlier, the steel industry revolves around China. China is the future and we have to keep a very close eye on Chinese steel consumption and production because that is the biggest factor as far as steel pricing is concerned. Um, before I say thank you, just to summarize, I think whilst we're in a weak market today and prices are dropping, I think during next year, we're most likely to see the impact of Chinese discipline and green appetite as being supporters of steel pricing. So I think whilst we could see a significant dip in the near future, I think the medium to long term prospect for steel pricing is firm and strong and particularly for scrap. Thank you very much.